Post registrations for upcoming webinars are available on rlpnetwork.com under the training tab. During the webinar, if you have a question for Phil or Stuart, please use the Q&A function specifically. The Q&A feature is accessible via the Q&A icon at the bottom of your desktop screen or in the three dot menu at the bottom right of your mobile device. Please note, Q&A is the only source we take questions from. The Q&A icon is next to the chat icon. Please use the chat feature to share any comments, observations, et cetera, and ensure your chat response is set to all attendees so everyone can see your comments. Let's try that now. Use the chat and share with us where you are joining us from and our big, beautiful country, Schomburg, Burlington. London, Whitby, St. Catharines, Montreal. Great, we're seeing lots of you rolling in from across the country, all provinces being represented. Lovely, lovely to have you here. Great, thank you for joining us. It is my sincere pleasure to introduce you to today's guest, Stuart Levings, who is the President and Chief Executive Officer of Genworth MI Canada, our country's largest private residential mortgage insurer. Mr. Levings holds a CPA designation with over 20 years of experience in a variety of sectors, including senior roles in operation and risk management with Gemworth and over five years in his current role leading the company. A warm welcome to you, Stuart. We appreciate you joining us today. Phil Soper, please take it away. Thanks very much, Kelly, and uh, welcome, Stuart. It is great to have you on the line. Thank you. Thank you both. Listen, uh, it's been uh, quite the run for you guys at Genworth. A lot of people uh, would uh, know your uh, colleague, Kiki Sori Rood. She's been, uh, and Debbie Person, of course, have been very, very uh, visible people within uh, the Rolla Page family for a number of years now. The partnership has, has really, really worked out well. And Genworth, as a uh, company, has really progressed over the years. What was your what was your market share? I don't know, eight years ago, ten years ago, and what is it now? So, if you come out of the global financial crisis, which was probably the low point in terms of market share. Uh, at that time, naturally, a lot of lenders uh, opted to go to CMHC just from a comfort point of view. We probably started uh, in 2009 around, I would say 22, 23% market share um, and have managed to grow up to about 33% now. So a good 10 points of additional share over that last decade. Um, and it's been, uh, it's been a, lot of, a lot of work, but it's been a fun journey for sure. You know what, uh, and uh, when your, your competitor is the federal government of Canada, that's mm. particularly impressive. Well, yeah, especially when, you know, they are AAA rated Government of Canada. So uh, no one has any concern about them being around for the long run. <laughs> we as a private sector have to work a little harder at that. But we certainly did come come through the global financial crisis very well. And I think that has, that has contributed to our ability to grow market share. Absolutely. Now, how did you, uh, how did you end up at Genworth, what were were you recruited from another role? Did you come right out of school? What was your beginning with the company? Wow, we're going right back, hey Phil. Yeah, uh, exactly. You know what? I, I'm a I'm a chartered accountant by training, so I was with Deloitte and Touche, the, the big public accounting firm, and um, I was recruited into the role of financial controller at what was ah. then mortgage insurance in 2000. So we're going back a while now. Um, and really, it was it was a financial role, and I, I was in finance, so that made perfect sense. And within about two years, I ended up exploring other parts of the company and moving around within that, that business and did some product development for a little while, working for Deb, actually, um, and then moved back into finance, became the VP of finance and then the CFO. And then right around the global financial crisis, 2008, our CEO at the time tapped me on the shoulder and said, I need you to be our chief risk officer. And I said, I know nothing about risk. He said, don't worry, everyone's learning right now. So it's <laughs> yeah. as as we went and yeah, that was a great four years of my career. A lot of learning uh, at, at a, a pretty rough time, I would say. Um, yeah. Then shortly after that, you know, 2015, took on this role as CEO and I've been in this seat since then. 
That's that's fascinating. That risk experience is coming in handy now. 100%. You know, when you once you've been in risk, you never leave risk, they say, right? Um, I like to think that we take the best parts of our experiences in, in the various parts of the company we've worked in to make ourselves into the best possible person we can be in our current role. And certainly risk management uh, in any kind of insurance business is really a valuable skill set to have. Um, and in our business, mortgage insurance, you know, you, you, you really do need to understand how mortgages work and how the economy impacts uh, the mortgage market and the housing market, frankly. Okay. One more little bit of uh, letting the national network get to know you a bit. Where were you born and raised? So actually, um, many people understand that I am South African. Um, however, I was actually born in Zimbabwe. Uh, okay. Harare, and then we moved to South Africa when I was pretty young. So I like to think of myself as South African. And for the most part, I, I was raised in South Africa and uh, spent most of my years in Cape Town, which is a beautiful city. For those yes. who have visited, they will know what I'm talking about. And for those who haven't yet, put it on your list. Definitely a worthwhile trip. Um, and then I came over to Canada in 1998 with my, my wife and two young children, uh, again, with Deloitte and Touche, the accounting firm. So it was supposed to be a two-year exchange, Phil. Here I am 22 years later. So obviously, I liked a lot about Canada. I, uh, I moved to Toronto in 1995 on a two-year assignment. There and I'm go. still here. So there you go. The, Never it's a, it was two years, right? <laughs> <laughs> that magic number. Oh, yeah, that, I can handle that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I'm in for two years. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's uh, let's move right forward to today. Mm -hmm. The um, we're in the middle of another economic recession, but this one with with the the underpinnings, unlike anything we've seen before, including uh, the impact on our volumes of respected companies like we've we've never imagined. Right? Certainly not in our lifetimes. Um, right. How is Genworth managing? What are you seeing? And maybe at the end of this, you can explain a little bit about what you're going to share with the uh, the team online today, some of the, the research you've done. Sure. So let me start by saying that I think, you know, Genworth is managing very well, actually, through this environment. We are um, all working remotely, as many companies are these days, and we're able to continue to provide our normal client service um, uninterrupted, which has been great. And thank goodness we had practiced our remote uh, working plan for, for many years, just because being a fully digitized company, you anyways have an advantage in terms of being able to shift to a remote, a remote work environment. So we did shift very seamlessly and we've been very productive since then. Um, you're right about the environment being unprecedented. And frankly, you know, we've heard about the Great Depression. Uh, everybody knows about the Great Depression. It, it lasted 10 years. You had the Great Recession in 07, 08, 09. It was three years. Now we're in the Great Shutdown. Um, and it really is an, an economic, um, uh, I would say, driver that caused this. It wasn't a weak or broken financial system that got us here. It was a pandemic and therefore everything got frozen uh, instantaneously. And that's really been very dramatic from an impact point of view, but may well prove to be less dramatic from a duration point of view. Uh, and as again, as I said, you know, Great Depression, 10 years, Great Recession, three years, the Great Shutdown might only last a couple of months, but it right. will have impacts in terms of uh, many things in our lives. Um, for Jamworth, we obviously have immediately noticed the impact on the housing market, um, given that we, we monitor the level of new applications every day from a mortgage insurance point of view. And there's no question we saw a drop off beginning in March and running through April. And clearly that means, you know, everybody out there, all the agents are feeling that. And we know from data in the marketplace now, you know, sales are off a number of 67 percent in Toronto you know more or less in different parts of the country but I'm happy to say that you know I think when you balance it all out we're seeing about 50 to 55 percent of the volume that we had last year now in April and May so to my mind that's a positive the fact that I agree you know, things are locked down even though people are social distancing we're seeing a little over half the volume we had last year I honestly would have expected it to be a lot less than that yeah well, that's encouraging for us overall. Yeah, even in Montreal, where yeah. we were required to shut down completely normal practice, not meet with clients, not go on a client site, volumes were down, call it 70%. Mm. 
I thought it would have been, we actually had planned for less than 10%. Okay. Yeah. So there you are. It's more robust than one would uh, perhaps otherwise have expected. And what I'm going to show you uh, a little bit from a data point of view might support some of that. So what we're, what we do at Genworth is we like to partner um, every year to do a bit of a home ownership study. Uh, we partner with David McDonald from Environics and they do a survey. And really it's looking at home buying intentions, but also looking at um, financial fitness and financial fitness of homeowners versus non-homeowners, et cetera. So it's generally a good um, insightful way to look at the market each year. And this year, um, they did their usual survey, which was around the February 19th to March 5th timeframe. And it was about 2000 people odd. It's a statistically relevant number, but because of what happened and obviously dramatic shift in, in our landscape from February, let's say to end of March, we realized that it would be almost meaningless to look at just that data. So they did another survey right around May one to three. So the May weekend, and they did another follow-up survey then to gauge people's uh, perceptions since effectively we got into the COVID-19 situation. So That's it's fascinating then. So you, for the very first time, went to market, judged mm -hmm. what would be called a normal, normal for Canada, buoyant yeah. uh, aspirations, expectations about the real estate market, mm -hmm. and then halfway through the pandemic so far. Yes, exactly. That's fascinating. So so there'll be some that you'll see where the data shows quite a difference and some where it doesn't, which is almost equally as, as interesting. So if it's okay with you, Phil, then I'll switch over to, to share. Absolutely. Um, and um, let's just make sure that it works. So first confirm for me that you see my- It, it is. It is up and it is beautiful. All right. Right. Well then let's get into it. So without any further, uh, do uh, let's see now. Okay, well, first of all, I got to just figure out how to make it move. Ah, there we go. Okay, so the first thing they look at is really what is the sort of what's the breakdown amongst home ownership itself? E that is, you know, i.e., you own a home or you own a home with no mortgage or you rent or you live with no rent. And, and basically, there was really not a lot of differences here, just year over year. This is really. Um, not even to compare with May, it was simply what happens year over year. And frankly, it's a lot of stability to this. And you would expect that, I would say. Um, obviously, millennials and new to Canada are often more in the rent bucket, uh, potential future buyers, people that own a home with a mortgage, the big 40% chunk are generally speaking folks in that family rearing age. They got a lot of other bills to pay. Um, and then older more established, financially secure folks generally fall into the 28% that own with no mortgage. Um, but basically, what you really see here is that the, the future buyers are sitting in that green 25%. These are your millennials, uh, oftentimes new to Canada folks, who become the pipeline of future buyers. So not too surprising there. One thing that will show throughout is that homeowners on balance tend to show a stronger overall financial fitness level, which really just speaks to the benefits of home ownership. And I think we as Canadians all know um, that generally Canadians embrace home ownership, but we have one of the highest home ownership rates in the world. Uh, and we should be proud of that. Um, if you flip to the next screen here now, you're gonna start to see, um, you know, the question that was posed here is, when do you expect to buy a home? So these are obviously amongst those non-homeowners. And prior to the, um, the May survey, you can see that there was a little bit of a dip off in terms of the intention to buy within uh, 24 months or two years. And really you could argue that people were starting to say, well, you know, um, the markets have heated up a little bit again. Uh, it's becoming more competitive because we all know that there was a slowdown through 18 and into 19, but that turned around in 2019. And you can see there uh, 2019, we definitely saw uh, an improvement. People were getting into the market. By February of this year, you could say people were starting to say maybe now is a bit of a, a waiting period. However, um, once you go to the May segment, you see that that actually picked up a little bit again. Now it's up to 20%. Um, and really, I think what we see here, what the real story behind this is, and you'll see this throughout this data, is that there's a sense of opportunity now. There's a sense that these um, unique circumstances that we find ourselves in may present non-homeowners 
a bit of a unique opportunity to enter the housing market for two reasons. One, they obviously notice rates have come down and, and mortgage rates have, and that's a plus from an affordability point of view, but also they will sense that there may well be less of a frenzied housing market at the moment, especially in bigger markets like Toronto, Vancouver, there may be an opportunity to get into the market without the usual bidding walls, et cetera. So as a first time buyer, I think there's a bit of an increase in optimism here that now might be a good time to buy. So that clearly comes through there. When we switch to um, what, is there, what is the change in expectation, if any, for those who already own a home, and the takeaway here really is you'll see between now and, and May, no real change. So really, I would say the, 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 the nut of it here for me is that those who already own a home have a little bit of stability in that they have options. They could either say, um, I might resell now and buy up because I might want to buy that next move up home again with low interest rates and less of a, of a frenzied market. But at the same time, they're thinking, but I've also got to sell now. I'm not sure I want to sell in this market. So I think the takeaway, if you look at the prior years, is this tends to be fairly stable. You know, outside of 2018, it's been 15, 16, 15. So not a lot of change in this area. When you go to um, the next slide, and this is asking the question, what sort of down payment do you expect, again, for non-homeowners to make if you were to buy now? We see now that, um, and I'll flip real quick to the May piece, you'll see that more intend to put down less than 20%. Quite a sizable chunk of people now expect to put down less than 20%. And that's, to me, that's very, very clearly driven by a source of down payment. So when you think about first-time buyers, most of the time they've saved some money. Um, they might have it in their investments. And obviously at this point, no one really wants to liquidate investments to try and um, to do anything with it, frankly, just to realize those losses. So I think what, what we're seeing here from respondents is that they're gonna have to reduce the amount of money they put down. Um, now, selfishly, that's good for mortgage insurers because it means higher demand for, for mortgage insurance. Um, but it's also telling on the impact that so far what the pandemic has had on some of the future buyers. That said, clearly um, people still intend to buy. Uh, they might just have to put down a little bit less on their mortgage. If we move to the next slide, this is now getting into the financial fitness aspect of the survey. Um, and again, the goal here has been historically just to get a gauge of people's sense of their financial fitness. It's not asking questions like, what is your net worth or what's your income? It's more about sentiment around I feel financially secure or less secure than I did before. Um, and it's a good gauge to measure um, the difference in sentiment between those who actually already own a home and those who, who don't yet. Um, Genworth has actually partnered with, uh, with them to do this for the last couple of years. Um, and it's really the Canadian Association of Credit Counting Services that uses this index as well to gauge where people are sitting, what, you know, where Canadians are in terms of financial fitness. So, if we move on into this slide, you can see the, his, the history here from when we first did it. Um, and back in 2011, we set the base at 100 and then measured it from there on. You can see that it kicked off with a fairly substantial decline into 2012. And I think, you know, if you think back to then, you'll remember there was, there was some dislocations again in oil prices and in global markets, um, you know, sort of a coming out of the global financial crisis, things were doing fairly well and then it kind of slumped again. But since then, there's been a pretty steady increase right up to the peak, actually, which was right around February this year. Um, and as I mentioned before, you know, you saw a lot of things changing. You saw housing markets doing really well from like 2015 onwards in the major centers. Um, you saw a little bit of a slump in 2019 and 20, late 2018 as they introduced the mortgage rate stress test and those kinds of things. But that picked up pretty quickly again. Um, and right at February, we had a peak. Now, obviously, since then, it's come off a lot. Um, it's not down all the way it was in 2012, but it certainly has taken a hit, not surprisingly. Um, and the ones that have shown the steepest decline clearly would be those who have been more at risk of losing their jobs or who have actually lost their jobs. That would include those working part-time, um, more of your new to Canada folks uh, who have less resources established here in the country, Albertans who unfortunately are sitting with a double whammy of not only the pandemic, but also very low oil prices. Um, and then surprisingly, those with 
income is greater than 150,000. And really when you dig into that, it's all about the investment portfolios. Now these are folks who probably have had a bit of an investment portfolio saved up. And when they look at it now, it's, it's red ink everywhere. And obviously that will impact people's perception of their financial fitness. When you move on to um, sort of how things have changed over the past 12 months, I would say in February, um, you know, we, we had seen a good chunk of people saying that it had stayed more or less the same. About 15% said it got worse um, and about 26% said it got better, but obviously that will shift in May. So in May, you see a lot less people saying things have gotten better, only 19% now, and a lot more people saying things have gotten worse. So again, up to 30% there now. And once again, when you look at who or where, um, it's Alberta that is seeing a lot of their financial situation deteriorate, um, and that's not too surprising. Um, if we move on to the impact of COVID-19 on employment, uh, I think the main takeaway here is that about 32%, if you look at the bottom two, actually not the very bottom one, they're not the 1%, but the other two, 27% and 5%, 32% uh, have had a serious or very serious impact on their income. Um, sort of on the plus side, 46% uh, have had no impact, none whatsoever. Um, and then another 21 have had a minor impact. So I think it's important to note that the impact of COVID-19 has certainly not been uh, equal across the population of Canada. Unfortunately, we know that it has impacted uh, women more. It has impacted people that have lower income or more hourly wages more. Um, and that's you know, unfortunate because um, those folks are probably the ones who could least afford to be impacted by it. Um, the one takeaway that when we dig down into the data is that those who are homeowners appear to have been less impacted at this point. And I would say that that speaks more to the income demographic than anything else. In other words, if you're not earning as much, um, you probably weren't a homeowner, and those are the folks who have had the biggest impact from a job loss point of view. So it is a compounding impact, unfortunately. Um, and then new Canadians are also more likely to say that they have been impacted seriously or very seriously. Again, not surprising. Uh, typically, uh, new Canadians will be trying to establish themselves in Canada, may not be uh, earning a lot at that point, uh, may be more in the hourly working segment, and are obviously therefore more impacted by this so far. When we go to um, sort of the knock-on knock impact, when you think about people who've lost their jobs or being led to, con to be more concerned about their income, even if they haven't lost it yet, you know, the mortgage payment deferral program really comes into play. And that was something that um, I'm proud to say we worked very collaboratively with our other two competitors to quickly roll out um, for insured mortgages. The banks were working closely with us. They were hoping to do something for their uninsured loans. And we said, it makes sense to do it for insured at the same time. That's why you saw that widespread rollout and frankly, wide scale adoption of it too. Um, to date around 740,000 people have actually uh, taken it up. It works out to roughly 11%, uh, uh, well, sorry, actually it works out to roughly 10% when you look at the data um, which lines up with our survey here, where about 11% say they've actually applied for the mortgage deferral. Um, we ourselves were a little higher. We were 13%. And not too surprising. I think you'll see a skewing towards the high ratio market a little bit more because as you see in the data here, first time buyers are more likely to have applied, uh, in fact, uh, up to 25%. So that isn't too surprising. These are new homeowners, new mortgagers, they are less established, less secure with their mortgage. Um, perhaps more importantly, you'll see that there's up to 20% that think they may still need to apply for it. And I would say those are folks who are concerned about their income, but are trying to write it out. And what it means is that we may see further adoption of this um, payment deferral in time. The lenders and ourselves as mortgage insurers are certainly evaluating whether we need to extend the window for payment deferral because it has proven in the past to be a very successful tool to avoid foreclosures. And obviously everybody wants to avoid a foreclosure if we can. So we'd be very open to extending it if it made sense. Um, there will also be those who initially took the payment deferral simply because they wanted the extra comfort, but quickly decide, you know what? I'm not in as much of a difficult situation as I thought. And I don't really wanna be compounding my interest, paying interest on interest. So 
I'm going to come off the payment deferral too. So it'll be interesting to see where it goes from here. Um, I think the massive wave that we've seen is the lion's share of it. I don't expect that number to double. I think it'll start to stabilize. Um, moving on to sort of what buyers anticipate their own actions to be coming out of this. And I think this is a really positive message. When you look at that data, um, and this was now as of May, you can see that a full third or 35% even believe they will come back to the market within three months. Um, and then another 18% will wait at least three months to see you know, what the market does before coming in. But it's only about 46% that are going to be uncertain as to whether they want to come back to the market. So I think that's a plus. You know, we take away from this that the desire to own a home is still strong within Canada and COVID-19 is not going to break that desire. It's really going to be a degree of caution that drives people back into the market sooner or later. Then finally, just to bring it, bring it home here, Phil, so we can get back to a discussion. Um, in terms of conclusions, I think it's important to note that you know, Canadians and Canadian homeowners um, show, have been showing their, their strongest financial fitness to date, uh, right up to the peak in February before coming off in the, in the COVID-19 situation. I would say that the impact would have been far worse had it not been for the wide scale rollout of government stimulus and, and support. Um, there's no question that all this um, you know, support in the form of the CERB and the wage subsidy is a tremendous bridge that people view as helpful in getting through this situation. And if it weren't for that, I think that financial index would have fallen a, a lot more than it actually did. And then, and then lastly, I think there's definitely a positive sentiment amongst new Canadians and millennials in particular, who are typically more of your future buyer cohort that, that view the current environment as likely a good opportunity to get into the housing market. So with that, uh, I'm gonna stop sharing so we can go back to a normal screen and i um, happy to engage in any dialogue. Yeah, wow, that is fascinating. And I'm sure uh, the role of painters from coast to coast will agree incredibly encouraging uh, data. Not unexpected, but incredibly encouraging. At, mm -hmm. uh, up to this point, until you release this data, much of what we've been sharing has been based on previous recessions, based on the strength of the underlying economy. As you pointed out, Stuart, this is a health crisis that, that created a financial crisis, the fundamentals for our economy and our housing market remain strong. One thing I thought we could uh, dive into, and I know Kelly, she collects uh, questions from the field, but let me get a, a couple of the first ones going. Sure. I was, I was quite intrigued by the bump in people that expect to uh, put down less than 20% as, as a down payment. One of our theses, theses one of mine, uh, is that like 2009, first time home buyers may be more um, interested in getting into this market than the mix overall. And they could represent a larger pie, slice of the pie than the, the mix overall. Could it be that the, the, this opportunity, particularly in, say, our three biggest cities, Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver, has encouraged younger people who tend to be somewhat <clears throat> more willing to take on risk associated with the health crisis itself, and, and it, rightfully so, the, the danger skews um, uh, greater as you get older. Could it be they're making up more of the mix of people who have intended? In other words, people who weren't intending to get into the market are now saying, you know what? I think uh, home prices might be softer. Uh, I think it's time to make a move. I wasn't planning on it. Is that possible? I would say absolutely. I mean, anecdotally, what I would say I'm thinking about from this data is that there is no question um, first time people, first time buyers um, who are currently renting view the value of home ownership now ever more so with all of this work from home. You know, I think people are saying I'm spending time at home now. In fact, I would say anecdotally, people expect that the, the work from home syndrome, if you will, uh, that might've been slightly negative before, people were either viewed as, you know, you're trying to take advantage or it's, it's a benefit for a few, 
I think it's going to be more normalized now. I think there'll be a lot more encouraged work from home. I think companies are going to reevaluate their employee base and say, do we really need as much office space? And in that sort of environment, who doesn't want to own a home that you can have your own office in and actually work comfortably from home versus maybe in a rental accommodation that isn't as such? The other thing that goes hand in hand with that is the ability to now potentially look at buying maybe more not rural, certainly, but more urban or suburban and not so much in the core cities where people were always doing the translation between affordability and commute. Now they might be saying, well, if I have a greater confidence about the ability to work from home, maybe I'll buy that single detached home a little bit further out from the main city that I can still afford, but will give me far more optionality in terms of what I want to do with a home. Um, and all of these, I think there is a skew towards those who aren't homeowners yet. So yes, the first time in tenders. Um, and they're saying that there is opportunity right now. Rates are low. Rates will probably remain low for some time. There will be less um, frenziness in the market, less hype. And frankly, I can potentially, because of the reasons I just stated, look a bit broader. I don't need to focus my attention only on one market close to my workplace. I might be able to focus a bit broader in terms of my target area. And that gives us that gives people optionality, um, and I would say um, we personally would say that the level of penetration of high ratio mortgages will likely increase from now through 2021. It's fascinating, you know, and and I'd say in the mainstream media the feeling is exactly the opposite. And I've seen I've seen uh, business reporters, not real estate reporters, uh, opine on this and suggest you know that first time buyers. Uh, wouldn't be uh, a material part of this next coming market because they'd be frightened, et cetera, et cetera. The, mm. the history just doesn't show that to be true. This is, mm. this, we see this in Vancouver more, don't we? Because mm. it's a twitch here market. When markets do plunge, we tend to see a, a leaping, a, like a once, once in, a, in a decade yes. opportunity. Yes, yes, absolutely, Phil. And that's something that we've always relayed to our investors is that People who think, oh, the housing markets could crash and really see significant price declines. We always refer them to the fact that there's always a level of pent up demand for especially around the major markets that are sidelined. And the minute they see that introduction of affordability or even just less hype and an ability to get into the market, that's when you see buyers come forward. And that acts as a flaw to the level of house price decline. So that's important. The other thing I would say is that right now, as an industry, one of our challenges has been supply. And I don't need to tell you or your audience that, you know, having adequate supply has been tough, especially for certain segments like the first time buyers who need a certain affordability point. And so even though there's a strong desire now for them to enter, supply will still be a constraint. So what we need to do, hopefully as an industry, is still encourage those who would be move up buyers to, to right. see the opportunities as well. And to say, look, you know, this is not bad for you to sell now either. The markets are not plunging. You're not gonna get a lot less for your home. And you might still benefit from a move up where there is good interest rates right now and potentially less of a compound multiple bidding situation. Because we do yeah. need that chain to open up as well. Well, that, uh, that very, very helpful. And I know people are, and I see it in the chat, people are, mm -hmm. are uh, leaking on this and they're going, wow, this is incredibly useful information. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about defaults, um, recovery. The, we historically, or particularly in, in uh, the last, well, since the financial crisis, have had uh, uh, amazingly low uh, foreclosure activity, default on, on mortgages. Uh, so your recovery activity, it's been quite low, right? What were, were we at 0.24 of 1% coming into the crisis? Yes, very, very I, low. I, very low. And, and something like 11 times lower than the United States. So just for our, our, our listeners to put this into perspective. Yes. Now that the governor, uh, Governor Polis suggested in a financial update last week or at the end of the previous week that he could see uh, foreclosure activity uh, potentially being more than double what it was during the financial crisis. And I read this and I went, hmm. So then I, and that was the headline, of course, in a, in a story. And I dove into his comments. And what he was really referring to is it could 
in his uh, expectation, in their modeling, could get up to 0.8 of 1%, so dramatically lower than the United States. Um, but that was at the outer reaches of their modeling. In other words, worst case. Yes. Do you, do you uh, share publicly any of your modeling as to where you think default rates could in fact end up? Well, yeah, let me, let me address that. So you're right. He definitely did alarm people, I think, by making a reference to the 0.8 that you referenced there, Phil. I think, you know, two things. One, he also pointed out how much higher they would be without all the bridging and right. sort of, right. the, which I think is important. It was going to be well higher than that if you didn't have that bridging. But even getting to 0.8, I think what was missed to your point in the fine print was that was in a bit of a downside scenario in their model. It wasn't their expectation or base case. And that's really important. We like to talk about scenarios because no one has a perfect crystal ball here on where the actual uh, economy is gonna go, what the pandemic will eventually turn out to be. But what we are doing is sort of painting a picture for people. We're saying, let's assume a base case scenario and that looks like this. And then let's assume a downside scenario much like the governor did and let's assume that, you know, that looks like this. And so in our base case scenario, we are effectively describing what's happening right now, where gradually you're starting to see more and more of the provinces talking about reopening their economies, more and more businesses allowed to open to the public again. And that will certainly encourage a bit of an economic recovery in the second half of this year. And that will definitely help to bring down the level of unemployment, which we know is peak high, but that, I would almost put very little stock in the value of looking at current unemployment rates. It's, there's too much noise in that signal. You have to accept that it's artificially high. I would say what matters more is what will the unemployment rate be at the end of the year once some of the bridging wears off, right? And our view is in our base case, yeah, it might be 8%. Obviously that's higher than where we started the year at six, but it's also a lot lower than the current 13%. So that would be our base case scenario. And in that scenario, yes, delinquencies are going to rise from the 0.24 that they are now, but I wouldn't expect them to rise much that much higher than you know, 0.3 or low 0.3s thereabouts, right? In a scenario where we see a downside, and in our world, we paint the picture as there is sort of a second wave and the governments have to start locking businesses back down again. Nobody wants to see that, of course, but if it were to happen, we are back into more of a shutdown through the second half of this year, and it isn't until sometime that we can reopen. That's clearly a worse scenario. We're going to see unemployment much higher. We would estimate more like 15% by the end of the year, and we're going to see much more of an impact on the housing market because then that buyer confidence we were talking about, all of that goes away. People retreat back to the sidelines, and you're going to see more for sales, more foreclosures, and you're going to see more pressure on prices. Um, and in that scenario, I would expect delinquencies could get up to perhaps as high as they were back in the, oh, let me get this right, the 90s, 91 timeframe, which was about 0.65. Um, so we're not really modeling a 0.8 type of scenario at this point, but I would caution to say that it's not that it's impossible. It really depends on the scenario you paint, right? And if you make it bad enough, it could get there. But maybe more importantly, our current base expectation is that we continue on the path we're seeing right now and our delinquency rate in Canada rises to maybe the 0 0.3, 0 0.33 level, which is a lot lower than what the Bank of Canada is suggesting, of course. Right, dramatically lower. And, yeah. and one of the things we've shared with the team in, in recent weeks is the uh, coordinated approach uh, that you, the financial institutions and the federal government have taken to allow people to defer their mortgages for six months mm -hmm. and so critically not default on their obligations to their financial institution means that they're not taken out of the equation. They can remain buyers and sellers of homes. When they yes. get for foreclosed on, they, they get that big big red X on their, on their credit. Uh, and it mm -hmm. takes a long time to work back into home ownership. And this Very is, good. Part, part of what happened in the U.S. financial crisis when, it, when they were unable to continue to um, make their payments and, and double-digit 
uh, mortgage decreases just uh, resulted in years and years of struggle for people to get back into home ownership. Yeah, you're right. I mean, we're we're of the view that the vast majority of these people that have taken mortgage deferrals will, in fact, be able to go back to making their mortgage payments again. Um, and it may not be that they just go back to making the same old mortgage payment they had before. They may require additional help or additional modification to their mortgage payment. But as mortgage insurers, we're very capable and willing to do that. So we are working now with lenders to discuss various plans for when these people come to the end of their payment deferral program so that if they need additional help, it might be extending their amortization a little bit further again. We'll, we'll encourage lenders to do that. And the reality is to your point, Phil, you wanna try and avoid any, what I would call unnecessary foreclosures. People that can be helped still should be helped. It's only those who are completely unable under any circumstance to continue making their mortgage payment that will end up probably in some form of uh, default and actual foreclosure. And if you can keep that to the smallest possible numbers possible, it limits the impact on both the housing market and on the individuals involved, right? Absolutely. No, you raise really good points. One thing that's come up in the chat, maybe just I'll comment on it quickly, and then I've got a question on um, on home values. Yeah. The Some people have uh, been stating yes and you know, I see um, I'm in a secondary market outside of a major city and I see um, uh, seniors. Well, then our, our observation is those 5,000 baby boomers that are uh, retiring a week, many not quite seniors yet. Um, many of them are saying, you know, I don't, my kids have, have uh, flown the coop. I don't need the big family home in the big city anymore. So mm -hmm. I'm moving to some place where I've, I've got a commutable distance uh, should I need the service to big city, but it's a, a quality of life as well as affordability thing. But, right. and I think this is really critical for both of our businesses, we had a housing shortage in the cores, the legacy, uh, either detached, semi-detached or multis in our big cities. And this mm -hmm. should, so if you're practicing real estate in a big city in Canada, don't think people are going to be abandoning living in the cores of our cities. It's where, mm -hmm. Where, where the jobs are, a lot of them. It's where the um, affordability is because it, in multis there tends to be affordability. Uh, and, and of course, a lot of our first time home buyers and your customers are in the, the, the heart of our cities. Yes, yeah, I mean, that's absolutely true. The demand for living in those areas for a variety of reasons, whether it's proximity to work, whether it's proximity to amenities, um, will always be there. And if there's any bit more affordability, it's just going to drive that, you know, increased demand for those areas. Uh, we often deal with condominiums because that's what first-time buyers can afford in these major cities. Um, and certainly that's a unique property segment. And certainly that may well see some change coming out of this as well, just because we don't know yet exactly how investors will feel about um, holding onto properties that they may have acquired because rents are being depressed a little bit. Um, we also don't know what organizations like Airbnb will do as far as demand for their products. So yeah. there will be a bit more volatility, I think, around condominiums going forward for a while than perhaps in, say, other segments of the housing market. But we're still fully uh, embracing the fact that our first-time home buyers often do buy condos uh, in the major cities. Um, and then they tend to buy more single detached once you get out into other areas around the country that are a little bit more removed from the major cities. So quick question before we move to audience on home pricing. The mm -hmm. um, outgoing head of uh, CMHC, one of your competitors, is no stranger to making, well, strange uh, comments <laughs> about the housing industry, given he's supposed to you know, be a protector of such. He, in, in a recent release where they declined to produce their typical forecast on uh, home values, saying that the, um, the environment was uh, uh, too unsettled or something. He couldn't help but make a, a throwaway comment that he didn't think prices were going to recover until 2022. I found that uh, an unbelievable statement and no data and no yeah. uh, logic behind it, just a throwaway statement. Any yeah. thought on home prices or on uh, CMHC's comment there? Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. That was an absolutely unbounded, um, almost, uh, you know, carefree comment to make. And I think it was just thrown out there. Frankly, 
Um, that's why we come back to what we described. And we do this for our investors. As you can imagine, there are a lot of folks who uh, own our company stock and are very worried about housing markets and where they go. So we try to paint it for them by saying, look, under our base case scenario, which I described, is more or less what we're seeing happening now. There's very little impact on house prices this year. So never mind recovering by 2022. They're almost untouched by the end of 2020. In fact, you know, they might be down three, four percent. Um, I think that's very, very manageable. Um, and in 2021, continue to see appreciation. So that's obviously a very desirable outcome, and it is our base case view. In a downside scenario, like I described, where things are shut down basically through the end of this year, there'll be more pressure. But even then, even if we see more 10, 15 percent house price declines, I would expect a very strong recovery once things do start to open up, be that in 2021, especially again, for those who have not lost their income, because now they're gonna see even more opportunity. Rates will still be low. Prices, we just said, will be off 10 to 15%. There's gonna be a jumping in again, uh, which will be almost the opposite of what we would have seen in 2020, meaning strong house price appreciation, good demand. So I would say if I had to put my downside scenario on the table, I'd say by the end of 2021, you've got price recovered. That is excellent. In fact, it lines up with uh, the roll of page forecast released about a month ago now, which uh, saw uh, home prices actually rising by a measly 1% nationally, mm. a little soft in, in uh, Alberta, but not bad. Uh, again, uh, low single digits mm. and um, higher in uh, uh, a little bit higher in like the GTA in Montreal in the low single digits. Uh, right. The demand has dropped and so has supply and, and we feel they're going to grow in, in tandem. That Kelly, why don't you turn things over to you to uh, take some audience questions. Great, thanks, Phil. We have a question from Maureen Smith who is asking, do you see the government lifting or adjusting some of the qualifying criteria criteria that is in place now with lenders, such as the stress test? Mm, great question. So as you might remember, the government was actually reviewing the stress test right before COVID-19, and they were actually going to adjust a little bit, which would have lowered the, the level of stress. Um, that was put on hold because of the pandemic, unfortunately. So I think they will firstly revisit that again, for starters. And that will obviously be a welcome shift once that happens. Beyond that, it remains unclear if they'll revisit things like um, allowing high ratio um, refinances or um, extended amortizations to 30 years in the insured space. Um, I think there's still a fairly strong opposition to those things and the view being, of course, that you're encouraging more debt taking by people. And uh, we all know, as you mentioned, Phil, I think the head of CMHC is pretty vocal against that. Now he's moving on, but I think that he reflects the government sentiment on that. So for now, I would say that the, the early one will be readjusting the stress test and lowering the amount that it, it actually requires in terms of the stress. So that will be positive for qualifying. Um, but beyond that, I would not hold my breath on any big changes that will come out of this because I think they'll view, much like we just said, the housing market will recover pretty well. And so they won't, think about it as needing a lot more additional stimulus in terms of uh, relaxing qualifying criteria. Great, Thank, great, thanks for that. Um, Hugh Barnsley has asked, under the current situation of government policy favoring tenants' rights, does it concern you uh, regarding existing and new loans to property investors specifically? Mm. Yeah, that is definitely something we've heard about as well. And I would say that there is concern in the fact that, you know, the landlord still has a mortgage and still has to make mortgage payments. There has been, well, there has been some efforts, I would say, on the part of uh, CMHC, I'll give them credit there, in terms of the commercial mortgage loans that they've done, where they are trying to accommodate, um, I would say, landlords. But I don't think it's been uh, enough. And I also think it's, it remains an uneven, uh, uneven playing field in that regard. Um, I think the only answer here is that, you know, the quicker people can get back to being employed and therefore being able to make rent again, the better. And that's why I'm encouraged. I really am encouraged by what we're hearing across the country as far as reopening of businesses, people being allowed to go back to work. That will be key to uh, dealing with that issue as well. 
Thanks for that. Anything to add there, Phil? No, I, I think Stuart uh, has uh, nailed, nailed that one. We're, we're looking at unprecedented times and lots of levers have been pulled in, in our commercial real estate business. Uh, we've had lots of concerns uh, in this, this regard, but I can tell you from uh, our work and advocacy and working with the Canadian Real Estate Association in their, in their uh, advocacy work, work with the federal government, no economic, uh, no driver of economic activity is being uh, 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 not, not taken into consideration. And the government seems to be moving sector by sector by sector. Uh, and for example, they're looking after tenants, but they're also looking how they can help uh, landlords. They're, they're uh, looking at financial institutions and the customers of financial institutions. So, so they really, I think the, the quickest and most effective stimulus we could possibly have in Stuart references is to get people back to work. And I'd say we're on, we're on pretty good track, especially as the housing industry goes, because again, in Stuart's data that he showed this fascinating results, another thing surfaced, and that is the part of the economy that's doing the best are those that are homeowners. And 70% of Canadian families own their homes, 69% uh, of, of families. And that is that, is that, that stable engine is going to uh, be the, the base upon which the economy rebuilds consumer spending and the leaping point for our, our first time buyers, new buyers. So uh, home ownership, the real estate market is so critical to the recovery of the country and the government knows it. Yeah. yeah, and speaking to that stimulus, you know, when we had uh, Tim Hudak on the call from uh, the Ontario Real, Real Estate Association, he kind of dropped a little hint about land transfer tax, uh, possibly being one of those levers that uh, the government could pull. And there was a, certainly a lot of feedback on that. And Linda Olson has asked whether uh, the two of you thought any changes would be coming to land transfer tax. Hmm. <laughs> I think just... To, to give a little context to Tim's comment, Tim's a politician uh, by training, and um, he was speaking to a wish list. And uh, right at the top of the list, we are economically, uh, we believe land transfer taxes are, are a poor tool for the economy overall. They restrict mobility. They, um, they restrict economic growth. They're not a good tax. Nobody likes property taxes, but a general property tax is by far and away a better tax than, than call it an economic mobility tax, which is a, what a land transfer tax is. So we'd all love to see it gone, but Tim did admit it was a long uphill battle because it's such an important source of revenue and the government's been on a bit of spending spree. So yes, it's on the, the shopping list or the wish list, I guess we should say, um, until we see a politician mention it, uh, I don't think we should hold our breath. I, I was gonna just, I was just gonna say, Phil, the one thing that I think is is a big negative out of all of this, truthfully, outside of obviously the the the, the loss of life, is that the governments worldwide, but in Canada as well, are in so much debt because of this that we're gonna see taxes. I think incrementally more taxes, higher taxes as a way to, to kind of pay them back because there's no other way out of this. Uh, and that's unfortunate for, for a lot of reasons, but I think given the choice, one would rather have the governments do what they did and, and, and pay more tax down the road than not have them do what they did, so. Yeah, and they do realize, governments realize that, and, and I think this is, there's a bit of a consensus of unleading economies around the world that as expensive as this is, a mm. long protracted period of, very high unemployment and recession uh, with millions of people going on unemployment insurance and welfare would be much, much more expensive uh, uh, even than the, than the billions and billions we're spending to get through this. 100% true. Yeah. yeah. The Great Recession taught everybody that. Yeah, no kidding. Huh? The Great Depression too. 
Great. Um, thanks, both of you. I think we've pretty much answered most of the questions in the chat uh, uh, through whether it was, you know, after they were posted, sorry, in the Q&A, whether they were after they were posted. Um, oh, I have one just coming in on the chat. Let me just see this. Uh, Hugh Barnsley has said, can Stuart give any hints on what might be considered additional in discussion today as additional assistance to those who are facing extended difficulty other than deferral? Mm. Yeah, I can, you know, uh, what we would recommend and we'll be talking to lenders about is things like extension of the amortization. Uh, if you think about it, if someone lost their job and got reemployed, but at less income, which is quite common in these sorts of uh, circumstances, they may not be able to afford their payment they had going into this pandemic, but they could afford a reduced payment. And if we would be able to get the lender to agree to extend the AM, then that person goes back to making payments. And, and there's, there's an avoidance of an unnecessary, in my mind, foreclosure. So we've always done that in the past, sort of one by one on our normal sort of traffic. This is just going to be a much larger volume of, of people that might be impacted. But we're working to try and get lenders to essentially adopt the program of saying, under these circumstances, we might defer another three months, perhaps. Or under these circumstances, we might just extend the amortization by a certain number of months or years that would bring in more affordability and again, avoid an unnecessary foreclosure. And if there was ever a time in history that you'd want to be as a family for fi family finances, adding uh, amortization or length onto your commitment to a financial institution, now is not a bad time with interest right. rates where they are. Absolutely right, yeah. yeah. Well, listen, thank you, uh, Kelly. Uh, wonderful job. Stuart, this has been uh, uh, just a fascinating discussion. Uh, we are going to uh, spread your word to make sure that uh, everybody understands this uh, very valuable research that you uh, have unearthed. I think it's, again, reiterating for the audience and all those who will watch this uh, um, in, in its recorded uh, format, not just this week. This is one of those ones People are going to be reading, uh, re-watching re for weeks and weeks to come. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the unique thing in GenWorth's research is they, is they pulled people right before the crisis, before we believed it was a crisis. Remember, it was February when people yeah. were still making plans to uh, you know, hold big conferences like us in, in yeah. uh, foreign mm -hmm. lands. And uh, suddenly uh, the, the entire world changed and then it was done again at the beginning of May. So deep into the pandemic, uh, probably at the peak of the concern that people had. And, and so the data is quite revealing. And you said this at the outset, uh, Stuart, both for what hasn't changed, people's mm -hmm. belief in home ownership and their belief that they will have the capacity to do this and, it, and where it has changed, uh, yeah. potentially um, the uh, heightened interest among say first time home buyers, non-homeowners to get into the market during this quote unquote once in a generation oppor opportunity that they see. So uh, fascinating data. Thank to you and your entire team for both the partnership uh, and for what you do for Canadians. Uh, this kind yeah. of information uh, calms consumers. It makes them feel better about their financial uh, future. It really is a wonderful public service. Yeah, no, you're absolutely welcome, Phil. And, and uh, I know there's a request for potentially sharing the slides. I will check with um, David McDonald, who is the uh, author of the slides and the survey. And if we're able to, then we're happy to share those slides. Perfect, perfect. Well, listen, yeah. thank you again uh, to Kiki, Debbie, uh, our producer, Kelly. Uh, everybody have a great week. Um, you know what it's say? Uh, we're starting to open up across the country. Mm -hmm. We're more and more offices are opening. It's the new normal. I think one of, one of Matthew Ferreira, one of our long time uh, coaches, I would say thinkers, uh, real estate and business thinkers said to uh, us last week, it's, a, it's important that we don't, uh, we stop talking about this as an unprecedented time and start talking about it as today, the now, the reality, because that's what we're facing. And uh, this is not going to go away anytime soon. And if you, Link back to Genworth's uh, uh, data and Canadians' uh, attitudes. 
that's not a bad thing. The Canadian housing industry at its fundamentals remains strong. So have a great week, everybody. And we'll talk, uh, well, on Friday for Philosophy Fridays, uh, tune in. We always have a little bit of fun to close out the week. Stuart, Kiki, Debbie, thanks. Thank you again. You're welcome. Thank you.